welcome to the Cat Knits podcast. I'm Kat, and this is a monthly podcast where I share the knitting that I've been up to for the previous month. So since we're in late April, I'm going to share my April makes, and that includes things that I've finished, things that I'm working on, and anything that I've learned that I think is worth sharing. I'm coming from you from our apartment, so this is the living room slash kitchen slash dining room slash office. We live in a one-bedroom apartment in Vancouver, Canada, and we live on a bit of a busy street, which is why you might hear a little more traffic noise in the background, especially when people tend to get upset and start honking their horns. You might also hear little noises of our white lab goose. She's currently chilling on the couch, and she sometimes lets to, likes to get up to you know, have some sips of water or itch or do those cute little dog things. This month has been a bit of a crazy one. So I typically like to plan out what I'm going to do for the month. You know, this podcast is one of the reasons why I do that. I like to, you know, set some goals, some things that I'd like to share so that I have enough to kind of talk about. So I made my list of things that I wanted to do this month and I did not get through any of them. It's just been a stressful wild month and the reason for that is there's a couple things that I've been working on for over a year both of which I'm going to share with you today and it's just been some stress leading up to getting those things done. It's been one of those months where I've just craved simple projects so I typically or typically I mean the last few months I've been doing more kind of complex knitting things that involve charts where you kind of need to pay attention to where you are when you like put something down and pick it back up. But this month I just, I was craving stockinette. So there is a little more stockinette than usual. And I think that's gonna be a theme that continues on into May. There's some projects where I put down my Cumulus Blouse by Petite Knit. And I think I'm gonna be picking that up shortly just to do some fun in the round stockinette as more of a meditative, process than uh, like a learning thing. All right, so the big the big news is I have two things that are going on. One is related. I'm currently at the University of British Columbia, which is located uh, out in UBC. It also uh, it's very west of Vancouver and I'm doing my master's there in computer science. And as part of my research, I am conducting a user study and the study involves knitting. It's actually evaluating software with knitters. And I want to share that with you because I'm going to guess most of the people watching this are knitters and I would absolutely love it if you would feel comfortable taking the study. So the study is run by both myself and by my supervisor, Reed Holmes, who is considered the principal investigator of the study. The study is called Stitch Up. Updating and Understanding Written Knitwear Patterns. And you can uh, get to the study at knittingstudy.com. From there, there'll be a link which takes you to the study. And as part of the payment for participation in the study, I have five yarn prizes and they are all made by Canadian makers. So you might notice to my right here I have two project bags and these are the number one and number two prizes in the study. I was pretty excited so my prof gave me a bit of a budget of what I could pick and then I had to choose what I thought people might want to win. So I'm actually going to grab them. So these two they're project bags and they can fit a sweaters project worth of yarn. They are gorgeous. These are hand sewn in Ottawa in Canada. So the prizes are kind of from all across the country. They're made of Harris tweed. Oh, they're by uh, Miss Niche. Niche? I'm sorry for mispronouncing uh, the name of your company. But they're Harris tweed. So it's 100% wool. The handles are beautiful leather. I'm going to actually do a whole separate YouTube video where I go over the prizes in depth, but I just wanted to share it up close. I absolutely love this one's called the Autumnal. I just love the colors. They're super well made. As you can see, they were both standing up by themselves just a second ago. So they stand up on their own. They've also got a beautiful, um, the inside 
as you can see, is also lined. And then they have these kind of little compartments where you can put your notions and tools. They feel super duper well made. They also have this little thing where you can cinch up the top, although I think I would prefer just to always keep it, keep it open. And this is the moss colored one. So these are the two. I think these are gorgeous. I 100% would love to have one of these. I first saw her at Knit City in Vancouver. And this one, I also particularly liked it because of the lining that she chose. So it's this pattern of flowers and all these colors and it kind of reminds me of spring. So this is the first prize and oh this is the first and I think this is the second and then I also have some yarn. Let me just put these back first so you can see them in the <laughs> for the duration of the video and maybe get as excited about them as I am. So I have two different yarn prizes from Sweet Georgia. Sweet Georgia is a local company, so they are from Vancouver. I have used their yarn for plenty of projects, a project which I'll be showing shortly, or a couple projects actually that I'll be showing shortly. This is one of their sock kits. So this is their Tough Love sock, which is a 20% nylon, 80% superwash merino, and you get this beautiful full uh, size skein and then you get a 20 gram skein which you can use to do heels and uh, cuffs and kind of accents. I've made a couple pairs of socks in this yarn. I love it. I think it's a great sock. It's also beautiful. The color choices that they choose, they call themselves unapologetic color and I think it's a very accurate statement. So this is the third prize. The fourth is their super wash. It's a skein of their super wash wool. So I chose this very vibrant, I think wearable deep purple. It's called Trinket. And this is also a 100% merino yarn. Oh, we can hear a siren going by as I talked about. It is also a super wash merino. And then the last prize is two little cute knitting accessories. So of course, what everyone loves is a little bit of stitch markers. So these are metal stitch markers, which I greatly prefer. I just find they are a little bit more sturdy. These are the, those beautiful markers, um, which have little, each marker is more ornate. So these are the seashell designs. These are uh, designed, and I believe also made in Richmond. This is uh, Firefly Notes. So Richmond is next to the city of Vancouver. It's actually Steveston. So it's about a 20 or 30 minute drive outside of Vancouver. And who doesn't love cute stitch markers? And then this is a set of stitch stoppers. So I like to put these on the ends of my needles and these are made by, ooh, are these made by? Fox and Pine, I think it is. Yep, yeah, Fox and Pine. And these are designed out in all the way across the other side of Canada, out in PEI. And I chose a very Canadian animal. I chose the little, the little moose. I love these. You'll see I have these on a project uh, right now. And I do think I am going to get another set because I find it so much quicker. So I like to just, for instance, if you need to leave stitches live or you want to put a project down for a period of time, I just stick these on the end of the needles. I do the sets that I have. I can like screw on those um stoppers to the cable but this just it's so much quicker it's so funny I don't want to get out those little t-pins <laughs> so that's been my favorite is for leaving stitches off or if I need to like leave stitches live on a cable I might screw off the needles and then I'll just stick these right onto the edges of the cable rather than having to get something out uh, to tie it all together the study uh, so in order to enter the raffle for the prizes, you do need to participate in the study. The study is 25 minutes long and it involves a pre-questionnaire, which should take three minutes. Then you work on this knitting tool that I've created called Stitch Up, and it's a internet-based tool. It's a browser-based tool. You'll do two tasks in that, and 
you'll spend, I think it's a total of 13 minutes, if I can do math correctly. No, it's 12. 12 minutes uh, working on the tool and I'll throw in a little screenshot so you can see what it looks like. It's just, uh, you're kind of meant to play around in there. And then there is a 10 minute post tool survey. So the whole uh, thing should take 25 minutes. And it would be awesome uh, if you could participate and if maybe you're not a knitter, but if you know someone that knits that you think would be interested, it'd be wonderful if you could share it with them. With these research projects, they're really, you know, dependent on having participants. If I have five participants, you can't really say as much useful things as you can when you have, you know, more like 50 to 100. So I would absolutely, it'd be just amazing for me I have, this is, I'm trying to wrap up my master's. This is the last stage. I've spent quite a bit of time designing this tool and the study. So this is kind of the, you know, I almost think when you're making a Sunday, we're, you know, we're putting on the cherry <laughs> by running the study. I do still need to write the thesis. But the other thing is with the study release, I'm actually also releasing the Pacific Crest hat pattern. So this is the second thing that I was talking about that I've been working on for more than a year. So I had this test knitted more than a year ago today. And now, you know, 12 months later, I have finally updated the pattern. There was some really great feedback from the test knitters, which I've incorporated. And this is the hat. So I'll put it on. This is the one that I originally made. This was the original large, which I got feedback that it is too small, which I agree with because it is quite tight on my head. So this, this I did use uh, Sweet Georgia yarn. So this is knit with one fingering and two DK weight yarns. Uh, we have more sirens. Hope everyone's okay. And we... Uh, you alternate between the DK weight yarns and that's what gives it kind of like a softer marl, I would say, like kind of subtle sites, uh, subtle stripes, which is what I was going for. It's a one by one rib. And I did design it to be a bit more tight on your head. If you do want more of a loose, uh, more of like a, like this, then you can just make it longer before you do the decreases. I wore this hat every single day while I was hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail and you can see how well the yarn has held up. There's the Sweet Georgia in here, there's some Madeline Tosh uh, fingering light and then there's some Fiberco Acadia yarn. The, the goal of this hat was to help you use up your leftover bits and bobs of yarn so I've tried to be as accurate as possible with the estimates that you can kind of weigh your yarn and then figure out if you have enough to do the different sizes. So this is the other one that I did, which this one is the new large size. And as you can see, it is so much larger. It also isn't quite pulling apart the, uh, um, the ribbing as much because there, it, there's just more space, there's more give. And then also you can see there's an extra little bit at top. This one I think was just some really fun colors. So this one is actually still using that Sweet Georgia uh, DK mohair silk yarn as well as it's also using the orange is also sweet Georgia and that is their super wash DK 100% merino and then I have a hand dyed single ply I think it's called a Yushita yarn that's quite variegated and that's what's giving there's little pops of pink and a little bit of brighter yellow and brighter orange and that's what's kind of giving that depth and that's held throughout I think the fun thing about this hat is you can really play with color. So this hat, I this hat pattern, I'm giving it away for free. You to access it, you'll go to knittingstudy.com, and then if you scroll to the very bottom, there'll be a button where you can download the PDF to make this for yourself. I'll also be releasing it on Ravelry. Hopefully, I'll have done both of those things before this video is up, so that you can check it out. And if you you know, if you want to knit one, that would be great. Totally up to you. I'm just, I've learned so much by going through the process of trying to design a hat. I mean, like anything, you try it and you realize how much work goes into it. It's incredible to make it look polished. 
to get all the mounts correctly, to make those adjustments when you get that feedback from your test knitters. I mean, think like I was so lucky that people volunteered to test this, this hat. I really appreciate that. That was so sweet um, of the knitting community. I definitely, that's one thing I do want to pay back this year is I do want to test knit a couple designs. I have applied for a few, but uh, haven't been chosen yet, and that's fine. I think what I should do, which is actually probably a better idea, is pick designers that are just kind of starting, like me, uh, just starting and looking for those uh, volunteers. So that is something that I would like to do is test knit uh, for some other people. If you're, you know, if you're watching this and you have a pattern that you, you know, would like tested, let me know because I'm I'm totally game. Uh, to test knit something so yeah that's kind of my big my big two things I'm just gonna make sure that I mentioned everything I wanted to say about oh the last thing I wanted to mention is just that uh, it would be great if you could well you kind of need to use a computer uh, to do to both to do the study I've if you try to access the study website on either your phone or your iPad you probably will get a message that you need to be on a computer and that's just uh, from the nature of the study, it needs a wider, bigger screen. So if you could please use the computer, whether that be a laptop or a desktop, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so that is my big, exciting two announcements that have also been causing a bit of stress and chaos in the last month. I also, though, the fun thing is, is we are coming up. So when I film these, I like to release them on the first of the month. But that means I need to film them a couple of days earlier. And last month for March, I kind of cheated and I filmed it on the 30th, which was a Friday. And I don't normally cheat in the sense that I always like to film them on the weekends uh, because, well, it's just I have more time on the weekends. And then I'm my husband works from home, so I'm not disturbing his day because I kind of uh, kick him out of the apartment when I'm filming. And I cheated and I filmed it on Friday, which means that you know, I got as much, I maximized my March knitting, so I had so much to show. And then this month, very excitingly, I'm going to Vegas for the first time on a bachelorette, which is going to be so much fun. But because I'm doing that at the end of April, I now had to film two weekends before the month is over. So I took, I, I took my time from I, April and put it on March so I kind of had uh, three weeks of knitting to show versus four and this was the big thing I struggled with before I went to this like releasing on the first date is you always feel like you don't quite have enough to talk about so then I just was like oh I'll just push it back one more week one more week and I still did that a little bit last time in March by pushing it back so late just to have everything done it's so great to have this due date because it makes me work through projects and kind of keep myself a little bit honest with how things are going. Cool. Okay, so now I'll get into the knitting that I've been up to. Well, before I completely went into stockinette heaven, I made some more work on my Guthrie sweater. So the Guthrie sweater is by Caitlin Hunter. It is this all over color work. Oops. Um, gorgeous sweater. It's a yoke top down sweater. It's I knit mine with spin cycle dyed in the wool in the color Wooloo and La Bien Ami. It's their sport. I think it's just called Merino Sport. It's their Merino Sport in the color Winterfell. And I'm so happy I finally cast this on. I've had the yarn for this for I picked it up in August of 2021, I think. So it's been a year and a half. Uh, and it took me that long to cast on, even though it's just, it's so much fun to knit. It's gorgeous. So from last time, I ended up, I just showed the yoke last time, and then I finished the first ball of spin cycle. I split for the sleeves, as you can see. And then I did just maybe about that much of the yoke pattern and oh I don't want to touch my mic I was gonna put it on closer but I love the way the colors are kind of vibing with each other 
At first, I was so surprised with the variation in the skein. I didn't quite see it. It kind of almost looked like more of, I thought most of the ball was actually going to be these colors, like these kind of deep, reddy, purpley colors. So when I was knitting the yoke and I saw all the spray, I was like, oh my gosh, where was the red hiding? And you can see there's red in the sleeve as well. So in terms of progress, I finished my first ball. And then I went ahead and started the sleeve. I decided to start the sleeve because I realized I wasn't going to have enough wool. So last episode I talked about choosing my size and I picked up an extra large size based on my gauge swatch. My gauge is significantly smaller than what the pattern calls for. I think because one, I'm a tight knitter. Two, I went with two sport weight wools rather than a DK in a sport weight wool. And... Um, other people also have struggled with gauge on this sweater. And rather than trying to loosen my stitches, because I really liked the way that my swatch looked, I just upped the size. And the size that gave me kind of the same fit as my normal size was uh, an extra large. It was slightly larger. I could have gone larger, extra large, but I like I like looser, looser clothing. So I went with the larger size. And I was very lucky because my kind of rows were very similar. And I talked about how I was going to try to do like an extra large when it came to width, but a small when it came to like um, any measurements that were uh, lengthwise. And I was very lucky with the yoke that uh, I didn't, I was able to do that because there were no extra increases that I needed to make for this size versus the small to the extra large. Instead, all the increase in sizing was in the number of pattern repeats around the yoke. So it was very easy in this for this pattern for me to kind of go up sizes just in the width, not in the height or the, the length of the, the garment. Since I knew I was going to be out of wool and I really wanted to see how much spin cycle I would use, I decided to go for a sleeve first, especially because I realized that the three balls of Wululu that I have are significantly different than what their traditional Wululu is. It has a lot more orange and blue in it. So mine have a lot more purpley kind of colors. So I decided if I needed to add a ball that was a very different color, color work, it would be best if it was on the body and it kind of near the, the waist. Because then if I'm drawing any attention to myself, hopefully it's around like the thinnest part of my waist. So I decided to do both the sleeves and then kind of like do as much of the bust, which is kind of more my widest part in the purpley colors and then do any parts that need to be done in the brighter colors in on the body. I think it'll give the sweater the most cohesion. I also did a little bit of color. I got really lucky though. I just started knitting with whatever color is there, which was this kind of deep purple. And then when I wound my second ball to do the other sleeve, it just so happened that that exact same color was on the outside. I was actually paying attention as I was winding it and I was writing down the colors so that I could start, just have the sleeves start on the same color. I'm totally okay with them being, um, looking different. I think it would be this wool, I'm trying to just, you know, lean into the magic of the color changing. And for that, that means trying not, for me, which I normally like to try to control as much as possible, just kind of letting the wool do what it wants and seeing how it evolves with that. And I think, ironically, I have a feeling that my sleeves are actually going to look pretty different, pretty similar, sorry. When I was going through the color shifts, when I was writing them down, I was like, oh, this almost seems like the exact how my first sleeve. So I'm quite curious to see if these two balls, if they were almost spun at the same time. And that's why they have very, very similar colorings. Who knows? So this one sleeve is, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so I wanted to see, so when I did, there, it's originally it's supposed to be a crop sleeve. So I decided to extend it. This is where the crop sleeve would end. And that used exactly half a ball. So if I were to do a crop sleeve, I think I could get away with my three skeins of spin cycle for the entire sweater, but I did want to extend it just because I'm not really a cropped sleeve kind of girl. And uh, she goes through how to extend the sleeve and basically you just repeat the pattern that is done at the top of the sleeve and you just repeat it 
at the bottom. She actually, if you look at the picture in the pattern, she manages, she actually does all the repeats at the top of the sleeve. So you have this part of the one pattern being wider and then you switch um, to the other parts of the pattern. I don't know if you're able to see that that well. Um, maybe, I've never done this with the iPad before. Hopefully it's working. If not, I'll just uh, maybe show it in a screenshot. So I wish, I actually, to be honest, I think I'm, I'm very happy with how mine turned out, but just keep that in mind. If you're doing this sweater and you do want longer sleeves, you can make sure to kind of front load the repeating of that pattern at the top of the sleeve rather than what I did is did this pattern, followed it, and then added that at the bottom because I also wanted to see how long it was and how long the, the sleeve was really going to be. I ended up, only modification I made is I did one less uh, cable repeat. So one of the gorgeous things about this pattern is the detail that she put. So the ribbing on the sleeves is a cable, which I've never done before. And it was surprisingly easy because it was such a small cable. I think it was a three stitch cable. So you don't need to use a cable needle. Uh, if you haven't done that before, I'll link to Andrea Mowry has a great video on how to do small cables without a cable needle. And that since it was small, I could do it without a cable needle. And I think it's just that little delicate detail that I just, I love that in sweaters, those kind of subtle design elements. And I was really happy to see that she did that. It just makes me love the sweater even more. I got lucky too, because once I was at this point of the sweater, I was, I then went on to the body to see how much more body I could get. And so you can see this is, this pink here is where my first ball ended. And then this is, I got this much out of the second ball after finishing the sleeve. So I got probably a little more than two inches and I have this kind of bright, this is kind of what you more see as this colorway is this bright orange and bright blue. So I do have a little bit of that at the end here. So I knew when I only got that much done that I officially will need one more ball of the super beautiful, super gorgeous spin cycle. This is a very expensive wool. So I wasn't exactly stoked that I would need another ball, especially as a Canadian. We, the Canadian dollar is not doing so hot at the moment. It's almost like 1.3 to 1.4 to the US. So, but it's gonna be really worth it to have this sweater exactly as I want because it's, it's, yeah, I'll just wear it. I'll enjoy it. If I don't do this, then it might end up to the point where I don't wear it. And then it would be even sillier, you know? It's, it's a bit of that unfortunate thing where sometimes to finish something, you just gotta fork up the money. It's almost like I feel like renovations, you know? You get so far and you're like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be more money, but what am I gonna do? Like, if I stop now, I mean, as long as you, like, I'm lucky in the sense that I can figure out a, a way to pay for it. So, I mean, a, an extra ball of wool is not nearly as much as a, a renovation. Uh, so, it's, I can do it, is my point. And the nice thing is that they're actually located in Bellingham, so they are a, you know, couple hour trip. So I'm going to go down there and check out the store, the brick and mortar store. And I might film that and do a vlog. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. And here you can see I have the little stitch stockers that I was talking about earlier. So these are the little deer. Those are the ones that I picked out. We actually didn't have the moose. We, they're quite popular in the knitting store that I work at, which is Urban Yarns. And we get, we get refreshes of them. And when I purchased the deer, we didn't have the moose. And I think we might be sold out of the moose again. I'll have to check, especially because we just had Christmas. Well, not just, but I don't think we've reordered them since Christmas, the holidays, and the holidays tend to really kind of deplete, deplete what's out there. Um, yeah, this is going pretty well. As you can see, I did start the second sleeve, but I actually just started this right before the podcast this morning. And that's because I wanted to share with you something that I don't know if it's, I, okay, I 
think that I've found a new way to pick up stitches for me that I haven't really seen before. I haven't been knitting for that long though, so I'll share it with you. Maybe this is like a duh thing that other people do. Maybe this is a bad idea for a reason that you know about, but I've started picking up, so I'm very proud of this underarm. So this is all about the armpits and I find normally what happens is I'll have these holes and then when I'm weaving in the ends, I'll almost use the ends to like stitch up any holes that I have in the armpit. But as you can see from this little beautiful, beautiful armpit, I think I found a new way to pick up stitches underneath the armpit. So the first way I picked them up is the usual way, which is just where you pick up, you kind of, you have your stitches that are on from the yoke that are here that you have on your needles and then you pick up your underarm from the body of the sweater and then you join that you join the stitches that are resting to the under to the body underneath and that's how it works and you kind of you pick them up regularly but what I did and I filmed this that I can share it and you can tell me how right or wrong I am is and I talked about this when I did a pair of socks uh, for a friend what I do is rather than picking up like above the stitch, like in that bar, in those um, kind of where those two areas meet, the resting stitches and the underarm, I actually pick up two bars of the stitch and knit those two bars together. I just find it gives a little more extra support. And then rather than like, I think when you pick from the top, you're almost like pulling the hole bigger. But when you knit from the two bars, you're pulling from a, um, like I guess maybe it, it's just maybe a stronger fabric so it tends not to give so much of a hole and then beside that I'll do another one with the two so I, I do two stitches in the gap and I pick up bars for both of those stitches I'm gonna I have a video which will hopefully be playing right now that'll explain it I did the same thing for socks so socks when you do you knit the heel down and then all of a sudden you have your heel stitches here and then you have your resting stitches here and you pick up stitches along the gusset and now you're, you're joining your gusset picked up stitches to the top of the foot. So it's again, it's the same thing that's happening where you're going from stitches that are resting on the needle to I guess other stitches and you have, you're almost like gluing two pieces of yarn together or two yarn pieces together and you have like your stitches are up here let's say it's like the like this is a set of stitches that's where your needle ends this is another set of stitches I do find that they tend to split here and that creates this hole like a V when you join these two together so what I do is I pick up the bar which I find just kind of narrows the gap between those two two places I just talked a lot about that I hope that made sense let me know in the comments if you agree disagree think I'm crazy think that's a great idea that's a technique that everyone knows about that I just don't know about I'm not sure but I am excited about it I have to say when I saw the armpit for this I was just chef's kiss for an armpit <laughs> it's just been one of those things that's been bugging me and I, I think I found a way to to make it better I don't know who knows? This was back, I did this at the beginning of the month, back when I had a brain, and then I kind of lost my brain for the end of the month, and that's why you'll see the projects get simpler and simpler. Originally, I was hoping to have this done. That was the goal. Let's get the three done. Yeah. I am, the fun thing is, is I've now used up two balls of the three that I have. So it's amazing how much wool actually goes into the yoke of a sweater. Like when you finish, like when you split for sleeves, you're probably a third of the way done the sweater, which it doesn't feel like that. It feels like you have so much more left when you have to still do the trunk and the sleeves. But I've now done a sleeve and a little bit more of the body and I've, I'm actually probably close, like two thirds. I'm close to two thirds of the way through the sweater, which is kind of, kind of nutty. So I just have a third left. That's hopefully going to happen this month. We'll see if I can get my brain. This is what I'd like to present my thesis in, which would be happening at the end of May. So if I do everything on time. Um, so if I don't, well, <laughs> the goal is to get this done. 
we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, that is that. And then the other thing that I showed last time that I think I said I was going to get done, I also didn't get done as the theme of this month goes. Oh, I was just going to check to see if there's anything else I wanted to mention about the Guthrie sweater. I've been loving my notebook. I use it. I just use notebooks all the time. I have decided though that I'm going to put all these notes on Ravelry because I think like I love, I find it so helpful to read other people's notes. So kind of like how people test knit my sweater, you know, I mean my hat, I really appreciated that. People wrote notes about the Guthrie sweater. I appreciated that. I think I am going to add it. I think I might just do it where I update my Ravelry like once a half a year, like every six months or something. I did, yeah, I think I talked about everything. Oh yeah, the one thing I just wanted to mention, which I didn't mention, is that I'm using my little mini shorty needles for the arms. And I just love, I love not having to do magic loop. And that's a theme for another project. I love those little mini, mini needle sets from Chiagu. Okay, so the next thing was this R&R hoodie by Tannis Knits. Da -da -da. So last time I showed this, I think I was not quite, I was just down here, so I was just in the process of, it's a bottom-up hoodie design. This is the, I think it's the six-month-old size, and it's bottom-up, so you do, it's got these cute little pockets, and you go up, you, you know, double your stitches for where the pockets are, you knit the pocket, and then you knit behind, and then you knit two together, and then you get up to here, just below the armpit, and then you do the sleeves up below the armpit and then you do a reverse raglan all the way up. And then you do this hood. Check out this hood. So um, if you look from the top here, it's got a very interesting shape. So it has, it almost like your head is. So it has this uh, panel on top, which almost is like the flat part. And then it kind of comes up on the sides to that flat part. And she, it's all very well explained in the pattern how to do it. As with all baby things, I love knitting them because they're just satisfying. So if you want to feel good about your projects and completing them, do a baby item because it takes so much less time than an adult one. And they're fun because you can like learn little techniques. So I've never done a hood and I had never done, um, pockets before and then there's also a zipper involved so this is the part that I didn't get to that I wanted to get to uh, where the zipper goes up the front so I've never installed a zipper into knitting before and this is the Noro wool it's a silk cotton rayon blend I believe so it's all uh, viscose sorry it's a all natural fibers. Viscose is made from wood pellets, which I learned about, and then silk and cotton. I'm not a huge fan of knitting with cotton. I just find it kind of drying. I'm someone who, when they put on a dry pair of cotton socks, I get goosebumps. Like even just talking about it right now, I can like feel it. Or like using a cotton swab. Oh, it it something about the sensory of it just makes me get like goosebumps and that like like nails on a chalkboard like that kind of tensing of my body so I don't think knitting with cotton yarn is for me I think I like wool it's also a lot more elastic I find and a little bit softer and it produces more of a fabric that I like as opposed to the cotton it was a lot of fun. As I mentioned, I actually, uh, someone in the yarn store, she came in because she didn't want, she decided she no longer wanted to crochet her, a scarf for her sister. So she gave me this wool and that was so sweet of her. So this is going to be a sample in the yarn store that I work at for a few months. Uh, and yeah, it's, um, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought there. But the hood, I think I hadn't really talked about how to do the hood. So you you have all these, I can't remember exactly, but you have quite a few um, rounds on, you have quite a few stitches on your needles after you've joined for the neck, uh, joining all the raglan. And then I believe you do some increase rounds just to increase the width for the hood. 
And then what you do is at these two points, you start knitting stitches together and that creates this cool kind of, it's very amazing how just knitting stitches together can cause stitches to go like this. It can really, it's the same idea when you're doing like turning a heel for a sock. It's the exact same thing. So here you're, you're turning, this is the whole turning of the heel for, for the hood. One thing I will say is because this was knit bottom up, there was a zillion ends, a zillion. It was, goodness me, I ended up, I was sitting watching, I started Survivor, which I just absolutely love. So I started doing the ends because I wanted to sew in the zipper. Oops, I like to do the ends before blocking and I trim them shortish and then once I block, after I block, they kind of like wiggle. I got this tip from Andrea Mowry. They kind of might wiggle a bit, like pull in, and then I snip them all short. So I was doing all the end weaving in and like you Kitchener stitch the armpits together, which was worked out really well. I like the way that looks as well. So I was doing all this, which I think you can only do with a bottom up because you have the live stitches. Uh, I think that's true. You have the live stitches of both the underarm and then the body as you go up. But let's just say I started Survivor that day and I was like, okay, I want to get through all the ends. And I think I watched like three or four episodes and the first episode's an hour and a half. And then they go to about half an hour each. So it took hours to weave and do all the finishing on this little guy. For the underarms, I did do my technique again. So you Kitchener stitch the stitches together, but I also did what I like to do is I picked up, you know, extra stitch on either side of the armpit doing that technique I talked about. And then I just had one extra stitch that I, on either side. So two extra stitches that I was Kitchenering together. I'm gonna have a sip of water. Last time I was coughing a lot and I think that's because I was not drinking. My, I let my throat get dry. because I'm someone who does not really talk a lot. Like in a group setting, I am very quiet. And that is something, not that it's a bad thing, like that's just who I am. But that's one of the things I wanna get better at is talking and expressing myself. And that's one of the reasons why I did this podcast because I think I, it's like everything in life, you need to practice something to uh, develop the skill. So right now I'm practicing, it sounds so silly, but it's how I feel. I'm practicing talking. So learning to grab my words. And I guess maybe since I don't talk a lot, my throat gets dry, I don't know. But anyways, that's, yeah. Anyways, kind of weird, but it's the way I am. And uh, I did, the one nice thing that I thought was pretty cool is this has a, I cord edge that you start at one end and you pick up and you go all the way around and then you go all the way down the other end, but it really does bring the garment together because what you do is when you're picking up for this pocket, this is actually how you stitch together your two pieces of knitting is it's bound together through this, this I cord. And then as you go up here and you're going across the front, you're picking up stitches and kind of giving this a clean a clean edge. And you just uh, knit the stitches that are resting here, the live ones, and then you go all the way back. Doing an I-cord edge does take forever, much like weaving in all the ends. It's, it's amazing how much time you spend on finishing. You kind of, you get so much of the main body of the knitting done, but it's all those little tiny details that can really take up all the time. So I have I have blocked this. Everything about this is done except for the zipper, which hopefully I will get to this month. I did want to do this. I did pick up the zipper, so that happened, but I didn't uh, I didn't finish it. So maybe next time I'll be able to talk about what it's like to sew in a zipper into your hand knits. I haven't decided yet if I'm gonna do it by hand or use my sewing machine. Part of me does want to do it by hand just because I am worried about picking out stitches from a sewing machine. It will be more sturdy probably from doing a sewing machine, but if I make mistakes, I think it will be 
worse because I think the sewing will go, I don't know. I just feel like because it will be more stuck in there if I make a mistake, trying to pick it out will be worse. I think I'd rather pick something that's easy to recover from because I think I will be making lots of mistakes because that's part of learning is failing over and over again but keep going and that's why knitting is the best because it teaches you that it's all about the process it's not about the end end result it's just about enjoying enjoying seeing this thing kind of come off your needles I'm just going to check again I think that was everything I wanted to really chat about with the little the little hoodie I haven't yet decided who I'm going to give the hoodie for it's I don't know I've I originally had an idea but then I realized I have the whole issue of you got to combine how old the baby or kid is going to be with the weather where they're living so this is six month old it's a cotton sweatshirt and they're in northern BC in December when they're six months old so I think that's too cold you can't be wearing this would be perfect for like you know, April when it's, you know, or summer because it gets pretty cold at nights and for, you know, BC. But I don't think this is going to work in December, unfortunately. So I think I'm just going to keep this though in the stash because it'll be good. Life is going to get busier. So it'll be good to have a couple projects that are done and cute and easy, easy gifts. So now switching on to that stockinette that I talked about that I was just craving and was so much fun this is what I couldn't put down and this is maybe why I didn't make as much progress on everything else and this is I've always wanted to knit one of these this is the Oslo hat by Petite Knit Petite Knit another one of my favorite designers although I mean I love the way her patterns look sometimes I find her patterns hard to decipher which I've talked about before so this is her Oslo hat, but the mohair edition. And her Oslo hat, I think, is like the fourth most popular knitting pattern on all of Ravelry. It's just such a beautiful hat. It's knit in a very small gauge. So sometimes when you mix a fingering with a mohair, which is what this is. So I've actually got from Sweet Georgia, which is that company I talked about. This is their Tough Love Sock. And then this is their Silk Mist, which is a mohair silk uh, it's lace weight. And then this is a fingering mohair nylon, or mohair, uh, merino nylon. And I picked both of these. Oh gosh, what color is this? I don't think I wrote that down. Sorry, I will, maybe I'll just put it below. But I picked this very kind of steel gray, which I think will be very wearable for me. I love the way this is turning out. I think the mohair, it's interesting, this mohair was very much like felted together when I was trying to wind it. Like I had to kind of like pull it from the Swift, but it now that it's knit up, it's just like it's got such a great halo. It's incredible and I love the color. So this is, this is another sample for the store. Uh, which I wanted to have done to give to her for May 1st, but I won't have it done. Although I've honestly, I think I started this five or six, it hasn't even been a week yet. And look how much I've done. And this is actually double brimmed. So this is, you can see that I've, this is actually uh, knit on both sides. And that's one of the cool things about this hat is it is a triple brim hat. So super warm, tons of structure gorgeous design in my opinion. The interesting thing though is, so typically when you have a mohair and a fingering weight, that's almost a DK weight yarn, which her original pattern is a DK weight yarn, but she's chosen to do the mohair one with a smaller needle. So you do need to purchase a different pattern. And that's, I, I can understand why she did that, I think because I, the gauge is incredibly tight, like to the point where I had to consciously remember that I needed to not just be loose with my hands or else I was getting, my fingers were getting sore because it was such a small gauge. I think it's three millimeter needles. 
yes, it's three millimeter needles, which is kind of on the top. A sock will typically end at 2.75, and this you're adding a mo a lace weight yarn and you're at three millimeters. So it is a very tight gauge, but it does give you that great structure because it is so tight, so it's less floppy. And it will be more windproof, it'll be warmer because it is, excuse me, so tight. And I was knitting these using my Chiagu minis again. So this is the little set. It comes with three inch and two inch needles and then different length little cords. So I went for the longest needles with the longest cord and it's been perfect. So I'm needing the adult medium size. And I just, I didn't gauge swatch for this. I tend to find if I'm knitting socks or hats or anything smaller, I don't gauge swatch. I just go for it. I figure, I think because maybe this is true, maybe this isn't true, but you have, I think it is true. So you have less stitches in the object, which means if your gauge is off, it'll be off by less. Because in a sweater, if you're off by like three stitches, then that, when you add up four inches, you know, we're, that's like eight times that you're more than that, I think, I don't know, you know, eight to 10 times that those extra stitches come in. So then you have that eight to times, eight to 10 times increase. Whereas this, like four inches around, it might be like two or three. So I might have, it might be like two or three stitches too small or two or three stitches too big, which I, it's small enough that I don't, I'm lazy and that I don't want to do the gauge swatch. So I went with an adult medium. I kind of feel like that's kind of ish my size. I tend to have a bigger head, so I could have maybe done the adult large, but then I figured, I am still a girl and girls have smaller heads than men so the adult large might be for like a large male head and I might have like a large female head which might be an adult medium. Anyways so that's what I decided to go with. It's been so much fun to knit. So the reason why I've always wanted to knit one of these is because of the way it looks and also because I was very curious about the construction. I, we have one of these in the store that I work at as a sample and I just I couldn't even figure it out when looking at it. I'm not going to give too much away because I think that is something that is unique to the pattern. But what I will say is you, you do this double brim section at the beginning. So this was like originally like a lot of knitting. Like there was a lot of just going in the round. And then you end up joining it so that you have this thick brim. And then she has you do, you know, continue on with the stockinette. And that's so that when you fold this up, you have this beautiful um, looking uh, edge. Like it's just gorgeous. It's like perfectly full and thick. And then you magically start, uh, you go back to you flip back to being knitting again so that the whole time you get to knit, there is no purling involved when doing this hat, even though you can see that there is purl and that's just because she gets you to the flop between. I think that I'm gonna take this, I think would be perfect plain knitting on my trip. So I'm going to try to put it down so that I have enough that it would last for two there and back to Vegas this weekend. It's been hard though, like I said, I'm just loving the feeling of just knitting, not really thinking, seeing the satisfaction of doing a smaller item and having it build up. So I could see myself maybe sneakily finishing this before my trip on. I leave in like a week or no, five days, but I've knit this much in five days. I think I could probably finish this hat in five days. So it might be hard to, to pull myself away. I'll try, maybe I'll work on my Guthrie sweater. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Definitely not sewing in that zipper for a while. <laughs> I need to get my brain back before I do that. Otherwise it'll just be one of those things where if you're not like in the right headspace, sometimes doing something will just turn into an explosion of frustration rather than this fun, fun thing. Okay, cool. All right, so that is the end of the knitting. Then I'm gonna talk about some yarn. So I'll talk about my yarn of the month and then I got some other yarn that I'm very excited about. That's very unique, which makes me even more excited about it. Okay, but first I'll chat about this. 
So if you've been following along here, thanks so much. And if you've made it this far in my last few episodes this year, also thank you so much. And if so, you'll know that I'm doing the Breed of the Month program, which is out of a farm in Manitoba. Turns out she, I didn't realize this, but she's actually a former owner of a famous yarn store in Vancouver called Bad Anna's. She owned, started the business and then sold it moved to Manitoba and has now started a new business around sheep farming and also really around, I would say, education and promotion of Canadian wool and sheep farming and processing, which is very, very cool stuff. And part of her, one of her things, so I've got her calendar, but I also have her breed of the month program. So every month I get shipped a 100 grams of spun yarn in a new sheep breed. And this month, I'm very, well, it was the East Frisian yarn. This is the wool itself, the sheepies. They live in Quebec, and it was milled in Manitoba, so probably at her mill. And she did a presentation. She has a book, actually, on Canadian sheep farming and she talks about really how expensive it is to have a sheep and there's you know if you're not at scale it's hard uh, to you know have commercially available yarn so this is one way that you can kind of direct to consumer from the farm and try out all this different yarn so the east frisian it is a meat breed much like last month i have another meat breed which frankly i was not super stoked about so we're only in the fourth month of this and I've had two meat breeds and two non-meat breeds. The meat breeds were not bred for their wool. So they it is a scratchier, more outerwear wool. It's more of like a lopy is what I would describe it as. So she talks about it's best to use for uh, outerwear and like blankets, things like that. Since I have one skein of it, I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to do. I'm... My game plan is I definitely am going to hand dye all the yarns. That's going to be my fun thing that I'm going to do. Probably do 50% of them in the summer and then do the other 50%. I think a blanket seems like a great idea for all of them. Kind of have this fun patchwork breed, <laughs> varying breeds, or maybe weave them, maybe. Uh, blanket. So this yarn, uh, this sheep, it's generally a white sheep. They were brought over to Canada, I believe, in the 19, yeah, the 1980s. And the milk that you can get from these sheep, it's amazing, apparently. It's what the sheep are known for. They're dairy sheep, actually, sorry, not meat sheep. And they're super, supposed to be very docile, so they don't mind being milked twice a day, which it's very, very cute. They have, they're mainly white. So sheep come in all different kind of colors. They also have all different sorts of looks, so I'll have to... At the end of the summer, I have to put all the cards together so you can see the variation in what sheep look like. It's in Canada. I don't know if there's anything else that's kind of interesting to say about these sheep. The yarn itself is less bouncy. So I've had some yarns that are super duper bouncy. This one has like a little bit less stretch to it. It does still have some, some stretch, some bounce. It's supposed to take dye very well which I'm very excited about. We had some of this yarn by this actually the same uh, Les Brez du Bravage. It's they spin their own yarn as well. They do a single ply and they have it hand dyed by someone else and when the dye really turned out well. So I'm very excited about the fact that I can dye this and I should have a pretty well looking yarn. So as part of her Long Way Homestead, she ended up, like I said, releasing a book. And with that, she spotlighted some Canadian farms and their wool. And since I work at the yarn shop I work at, we ended up doing a pop-up with some of these local, well, they weren't necessarily local, but sorry, Canadian wools. And, and th these are yarns that you can't typically buy in a commercial setting because unfortunately, they're, it's just so expensive because it's, you know, um, niche, not niche, like small, you know, small farms. It's very expensive for them to shear the sheep. 
So by the time uh, they have the yarn spun, it's so expensive that there isn't enough of a room for a markup when selling it at a yarn store. So we did do the pop-up. I got this gorgeous, gorgeous yarn, which I am so happy I purchased. This is from Fiber and Forge. So they are in the lower mainland. So they are within a two hour drive of me. They have a farm and they name their yarn after the sheep that goes into it. So this is the Lily, Lisa, and Libby yarn. So it's from three L's and this is a Shetland with a bit of BFL. So I'm guessing that maybe two of the sheep are the BF, uh, the Shetland sheep, sorry, and then one of them is the BFL. And I don't know if you can see, but it's this beautiful heathering. It's also got like the spin itself is very, very cool. It's uh, almost like it's almost like a bit like it seems like a looser spin which gives it a little more like texture it's got a lot of texture to it it's incredibly soft yeah 100% Canadian grown in BC and it's spun spun in Alberta I was very impressed with their yarn they also had some gorgeous I love BFL so they had a couple other ones that were also BFL and I debated, I hummed and hawed, but I did end up going for it. And I purchased three skeins and that's because, let me show you the sweater. So like, this is one of the goals I am sticking to, which is I'm only buying yarn when I have a pattern that I know I wanna do. And so I recently found, it's, her name is Alex Bird. Let me pull, make sure I have her name right. Alex Bird, and this is the Selly cardigan. So it is a, ta -da! so Alex Bird, she does a traditional Estonia knits, and she has this gorgeous book that was published by Lane, and it's this cardigan, which has these beautiful details. So like I was saying, around the cuff, there's these braids that happen, and then there is this texture on the sleeve, and that, is done with using the floats. So it's got two new techniques that I haven't done before and I'm very, very excited. So this pattern was originally published in Lane Magazine. And since working at the yarn store, I started looking at the magazines that come out and there's some really gorgeous patterns that go into these magazines. So this is one of them and it actually also comes in a pullover version, which is the model is wearing the green one uh, behind her. I decided to go for the cardigan just because I like that detailing that's through the front. I like the fact that it looks like the rib, the ribbing, it is, uh, there's, looks like, um, sorry, I'm losing my words here, but the, the background is colored and then the stitch going down is in the main color of the body. So you kind of have that awesome detail around the, the neck and the base of the sweater. I think this color is going to go perfect for the body of that sweater. So I'm very, very excited about this. I've been trying not to get new wool, but this was actually mostly a birthday gift. So thank you so much, Ruby, for this beautiful yarn. Cool beans. Well, that was everything that I wanted to chat about today. Thanks so much for sticking in there and listening to, you know, however much you want to listen to. It's fun as always. I really appreciate everyone that stops by and takes a listen. It really does warm my heart. So thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful May. I can't believe I'm saying that we're going into May. Yeah, yeah, all right, bye for now.